Central American populations that we are going to be discussing are the populations of people who have and lived and who have come from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. And the reason why I focus on these three Central American populations, right? There are other Central American countries as well, right? There's Honduras, there's Costa Rica, right? But I am not touching upon those particular experiences because the focus of this lecture is on the migration of these three groups as they came to the United States in the 1980s. So the bulk of the Central American migration to the United States, the growth of the Central American migration to the United States occurred in the 1980s, and it would come from these three countries, in particular from El Salvador and Guatemala, right? Salvadorians today are considered the third largest Latino population in this country. They have, and, and, and Central Americans are considered part of what's called the new Latino population. In other words, so far we have been focusing primarily on discussing what are considered the older Latino populations, which are Mexicans, right, which is the oldest population in the United States, then Puerto Ricans and Cubans, okay? So they are considered the old Latinos, right? The, the older Latino populations. Central Americans are considered part of this new Latino population because, as I said, the growth of this population occurred in a more recent time, right? The 1980s. And so that, as I mentioned, the Salvadoran population today is considered the third largest Latino population in the United States. Only Mexicans and Puerto Ricans are more numerous than Salvadorians, right? And so that the Salvadorian population, again, right, has grown tremendously in the last 30 years, right, in comparison to the Mexican and Puerto Rican populations, right, which have been around for a longer time. Around one and a half million Salvadorians today. Let me ask, how many here are of Salvadorian descent? One, two, three. How about Guatemalans? Any Guatemalans in the house? All right, I can talk out about Guatemalans. Then. <laughs> uh, how about Nicaraguans? Do Nicaraguans know that? Okay. So, of course, now, you know, when we talk about Nicaragua, we're now getting into talking about the best country. Right? <laughs> so, in terms of Guatemalans, right, Guatemalans too are a population that began to arrive in the 1980s, and the Guatemalan population are a little bit over a million. Right? A little bit over a million. Nicaraguans, on the other hand, their numbers are not as large in relation to Salvadorian and Guatemalans, right? Nicaraguans are about half a million. Um, and the reason is because Nicaraguan migration has split between some going coming to the United States, but also others going to the neighboring country to the south, Costa Rica. So many Nicaraguans 
uh, chose to migrate to Costa Rica because Costa Rica economically is the most prosperous country in the Central American region. Uh, and so that many Nicaraguans choose to uh, migrate uh, to Costa Rica, closer to home, right? And, and so that, that as a result, you have a smaller number of Nicaraguans migrating to the United States. And the growth, again, I'm giving you current numbers, right? But prior to the 1980s, right? So these are kind of like the current numbers today of, of the number of people who come from these three countries. But prior to the 1980s, in the 1970s, the Central American population was practically invisible. I mean, their numbers were so small, right, that they really didn't constitute a visible community within the um, United States. They mostly got lost within the context of the larger, older Latino population. So, Nicaragua, Salvadorians, and Guatemalans who lived in California, right, primarily just blended in with the Mexican population, right? And people did not, you know, there wasn't a very visible, uh, distinct community, right, in the way that today we see them, right? In, you go to the mission, you're gonna have Salvadorian restaurants, you're gonna have Guatemalan restaurants or Nicaraguan restaurants. Right, that prior to the 1980s, we did not have that level of visibility in the U.S. because our numbers were small. And so, in the 1980s, what led to this migration, right, of peoples coming from Central America primarily was the result of conflict and wars that would prompt all of these Central Americans to flee, driven out by civil war and revolution. So that the migration of Central Americans, the migration of Central Americans to the United States again in the 1980s in particular, Right? In particular, because the migration has continued, but the origins of this migration comes as a result of this, so that these are political migrants too. Right? But the reason for coming to the United States was to leave the countries as a result of conflict. Right? So the group that comes in the 1980s are primarily coming seeking refuge in the United States, running away from conflict. And the conflict in Central America begins first in Nicaragua. So the first country that we're going to look at right, is the most important country, Nicaragua. And so... In 1979, in Nicaragua, you have a revolution, the Sandinista Revolution, as it was called. And this revolution will overthrow a 42-year-old dictatorship, the dictatorship run by a single family, the Somoza family. So it was a, the Somoza oops. the 42 year old dictatorship, primarily a single family, a single family uh, running the country, the Somoza family. So it was a family dynasty, so the power was transferred from father to son and from brother to brother for 42 years, a single family running the show in Nicaragua. And so it was this dictatorship that was overthrown in 1979. And so, as you can imagine, both 
this conflict in Nicaragua and the actors, both the Somoza dictatorship and the Sandinistas, were very much also contained within the Cold War. All of this, right, the civil wars and the revolution too, are still part of the Cold War. So we cannot sort of continue to discuss as well the uh, experiences of Central Americans without also bringing into the picture the impact of the Cold War, because definitely these wars still took place during and what is now considered, right, the end of the Cold War, right? So, of course, in the 1980s, we didn't know that the Cold War would be over, right, in 10 years, but that, that's what would eventually happen, right? As we've already discussed, right? The Cold War would be over by, by the early 1990s. But in the decade of the 1980s, you had this conflict, right? In Central America, that's what I meant, that was also driven by the politics of the Cold War. For the United States, it was the war, right, against communism, and Central America would be a battlefield of the war against communism as the Sandinistas were seen as part of that communist threat that was now emerging in Nicaragua. The Somoza dictatorship had been in power primarily because it was a U.S. sponsored dictatorship. So in many ways, the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua is very similar to the Cuban Revolution. And the migration of Nicaraguans out of the country would be very similar to that of Cubans. Okay? And so that we would see a similar exodus out of Nicaragua that we saw when we studied the exodus of Cubans in the 1960s, so that you would also have, right, let me, a first wave of Nicaragua, which I started in 1979, till so about 1981, that you have a first wave of Nicaraguans who would leave the country, primarily these were people just like in the Cuban Revolution, Right, members of the elite, and also people who were linked to the Somoza regime, right? So Somoza supporters were the groups that first left after the revolution. Again, they were, just in the case of Cuba, Right? They were afraid for their lives, right? They felt persecution and that they were going to get killed because of particularly those who were linked to the dictatorship. Members of Somoza's military that was and had been very brutal against the population and that they were afraid that they were going to be killed, that they were going to be brought to justice. And so many of Somoza supporters fled, and they would flee, right? The chosen destination for these Nicaraguans in the United States, too, would be the city of Miami. As Miami now, in 1979, had become the capital of the Cuban exile community. Now, Nicaraguans came to Miami as well because they pretty much felt welcomed by the Cubans. Right? These Nicaraguans were, were very much welcomed by the Cuban community in the United States as the Cubans saw these Nicaraguans as fellow big victims of communism, right? As the Sandinistas were seen, right, as this emerging communist threat that Cubans then saw in supporting Nicaraguans in Miami, right, as they fled as refugees, as fellow victims 
and the United States government as well would welcome these Nicaraguans to the United States so that they would grant these Nicaraguans and actually let me I have to change not 81 but 80 so please change this from 1 to a 0 okay this is the first group and I explained why I forgot to say something I'll say it later but that this is the first group and that this group would receive legalization, right? They would be given a refugee status, right? Members of the Somoza regime were given um, a refugee status in the United States so they would become uh, legalized in this country. People who were part of the military, part of the government structure, Right, they ended up in Miami. And so Miami would also emerge in the 1980s as the capital of the Nicaraguan exile community as well, right? Those who were in exile because of the Sandinista revolution. And so that this first group of Nicaraguans, right, were able to receive support, not in the same way that that Cuban first wave received support, right? They did not receive the financial support, but what they received was the more of like the political support, granting them a refugee status so that they could, you know, live and work in the United States now. But however, right, as more Nicaraguans began to arrive, that attitude would change for two reasons. In 1980, and this is why I had to erase the one and put the zero, because 1980 was an important sort of year, right? Where the policy of the United States begins to shift in terms of refugees coming to this country. 1980. What happened in Miami in 1980 in relation to the Cuban experience? The Marielitos, right? So Tony Montana came to town, all right? And with the arrival of Tony Montana, right, of all of these Cubans, the Cuban second wave, right, and sort of the way in which they were seen as problematic and the sort of 100,000 Cubans come all at once, that then as the Nicaraguan Revolution took place, there was already fears that a similar exodus would also happen, right? Of people fleeing Nicaragua after the revolution. And especially, right, because of the way, if you remember, that then as there was an election, the Republicans attack Carter for having allowed so many Cuban refugees. Should have never happened. And that then with the election of Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan comes into the presidency Right, vowing to defeat communism. And Reagan saw the defeat of communism in Central America. Right? So in the 1980s, there were two important wars that the United States engaged in, right? Wars, right, uh, that were part of the larger conflict of the Cold War. One was Central America, the other one was Afghanistan. And so that in these two sort of wars, in Central America in particular, Ronald Reagan saw the emergence of this communist threat with the Sandinista victory and the Sandinistas being linked to the Cuban government and to the Soviet Union, that the Reagan administration, when it 
wins, right? When Ronald Reagan wins the election, then Reagan vows to defeat the Sandinista revolution, to destroy the Sandinista revolution by arming and training an opposition. Right? So the Reagan administration would begin to arm and train an opposition to defeat the Sandinistas called the Contras, what became known as the Contras, which is short for the counter-revolutionaries. That's how they became known in Nicaragua. So the United States began to fund this military force, mainly composed of former Sandinista military officers and soldiers, to try and take Nicaragua back from the Sandinistas. So that the war once again restarts in Nicaragua, but already, right, so there are two things that happen after 1980. So you have, once again, the arrival of Cuban refugees, right, in large numbers, the Marielitos, 100,000 Cuban refugees coming all at once. And then the election of Reagan. And Reagan here, right, because of his particular view, which I just mentioned, also felt that if he gave Nicaraguans the open door in the same way that Cubans were given the open door, right, that this could prompt an exodus of Nicaraguans out of the country, and that it would have a similar effect to what happened in the Cuban case, which is, well, because all of those who were potential opponents to the revolution are in exile, then the opposition to that regime is weak. So what Reagan felt was then necessary was to then deny those Nicaraguans who continue to arrive after 1980 the right to stay as refugees. Because he said, Nicaraguans, if you're not happy with this revolution, right, with the Sandinista revolution, then stay in Nicaragua. So that then you can fight to defeat, right, the communists. But that of course, right, you did have people who continue to leave, right? For so many reasons, people fled, right? They didn't have the desire to engage in a war. They just wanted to seek safety somewhere else, right? To seek refuge somewhere else. And so many of them came. So starting in 1981, you see a second wave, which is now different from this one. So in the second wave, you have more people coming from the middle class. So if you remember, in the Cuban case, I have both the upper and the middle classes coming together. In the Nicaraguan case, right, because of this sort of split, right, because of this split between sort of what happens in 1980 with the arrival of Cuban refugees and the election of Ronald Reagan, that those who start coming after 1981 Right, with Ronald Reagan now taking the reins of the executive here in the United States, that then the new attitude and policy is to deny. Now, Nicaraguans who began to arrive after 1981, a refugee status. So those of us who came after 1981, and that includes myself and many of my family members, we came and became, right, in the United States, undocumented refugees. This is what we became. We became undocumented refugees. And I use the word refugees and not immigrant, right, because again, there is a difference here. If you're an undocumented immigrant, right, it's a very general term that one uses of people who are here without authorization, which primarily it is understood 
as someone who is an economic type of immigrant, right? Who comes here for, you know, better life, better economic opportunities. But in the case of Nicaraguans, right, of those of us who are coming to the United States, we were primarily running away from war, right? Seeking refuge from a war. So we were refugees, but the United States government refused to grant us a refugee status. So that's why I use the undocumented refugee label to describe to describe sort of the Nicaraguans who would come after 1981. And so that this would be the experience, right? So that people who were professionals in Nicaragua, many of my family members, right? I was a 12-year-old child, but the adults in the family who were professionals, right, did not, by the way, enjoy the same benefits that the Cubans had enjoyed. First of all, right, the Cuban middle class received legalization, and then if you remember, they received um, that they recognized their professional degrees. That did not happen for Central Americans. I mean, first of all, we were not even recognized right, as refugees, so we were just part of the large sort of mass of undocumented people who lived in this country. And that, of course, right, being undocumented also keeps you from having other opportunities, right? Such as having the opportunity to try and get your degree recognized. So people who were professionals suddenly found themselves, like a lot of my relatives, working in what was the undocumented labor market, right? Which is washing dishes, right? Cleaning homes, working in restaurants, Right? The kinds of jobs that are primarily right, for low-wage, right, unskilled workers, or low-skilled workers. So, you know, that this was an adjustment, an adjustment that um, many Nicaraguans, right, and I say, you know, many of us friends and family who came during this period, we had to make that adjustment. So suddenly my uncle, who was a manager, right, had a business degree in Nicaragua, was a manager in, of a company, right, actually was a U.S. multinational company, then he comes to San Francisco, and the only job that he is able to find is washing dishes at a bakery, right? So here is this person who had this training and this education, suddenly washing the pans, Right, and the baking sheets in this bakery. You know, the positive thing about that, right, if we want to find a silver lining to that, is that of course he would get all this bread, right, <laughs> leftover bread, right, and he would come home with like baguettes and croissants, right. The first time I tried a croissant, I was like, mmm, now it's like kind of one of my favorite, you know, and pastries of all sorts, right. So, uh, you know, that was kind of like the good thing about working in places like this, right, where <coughs> The leftover food was given to the workers to take home. And so that this was this was the experience of a lot of um, professionals. One of actually one of my former students, um, her dad was a doctor. And again, he had to work as a security guard, right, in the United States. Because of course, right, as we know how difficult it is to become a doctor here in the United States. Right? And furthermore, if you come from another country where your degree is from another country, then you know, your chances of being able to become a practicing physician, unless you get that help, like for example, that the Cubans got, right, are practically impossible. But actually, her dad kind of beat the odds. He kind of kept at it, kept at it, kept at it, and I think like 20 years after they came, he was able to pass the exams and once again, practice uh, medicine, right? But it took him 20 years to be able to do that again in the United States. And so that these are some of the stories of those 
you know, who came into the United States, right? We faced many challenges, right? Nicaraguans who came from the middle class, right, faced kind of like this experience of now being able to adjust to a life that was very different from the life of, you know, that many of us had uh, back in our country of origin, right? Where, you know, we had a very comfortable middle class life. We come to the United States and now we live in a mission, right? In a one bedroom apartment, right? In which, you know, two families sharing a one bedroom apartment were like about 10 or 13 of us, right? We're living in this one bedroom apartment, right? That's part of that initial experience, right? That a lot of us go through as we try to find our way uh, in uh, the United States, right? You know, we, we got so fed up with each other, right? Living so many people in one room that now we hardly see each other. I don't even want to see you anymore, right? Because we were like, you know, living so close together for such a long time while we find our way in the United States. But this was the initial experience for uh, Nicaraguans who came, right, in the first couple of years after um, the Sandinista revolution. But now I want to also bring into the picture the Salvadorian and Guatemalan, because we're Salvadorians, right, and so that the conflict begins in Nicaragua, right, in 1979. And in El Salvador and Guatemala, and throughout Central America, you had military dictatorships as well. Military dictatorships which were very brutal and that would lead to uprisings as well in El Salvador and in Guatemala. And so that forces, again, all contained within the, the Cold War, right? Forces that were seeking to overthrow the military government in El Salvador rose up and began also a war, an all-out war against the military government of El Salvador. And in this war, which is a war that was even more bloody than the war in Nicaragua, because it was a war primarily in which the military government of El Salvador would engage in an all-out repression against the population, against the student population, against sort of people who were involved in activism, anyone that was involved in anything that was seen as sort of engaging in social activism was seen as a communist and therefore right, had to be eliminated, including activists within the Catholic Church, right, in El Salvador, the military, because they even saw as the archbishop, right, the highest authority of the Catholic Church in any country, right, they uh, killed him. They shot him and killed him while he was saying mass. Archbishop Romero, he was killed because he began to condemn the repression that was being conducted by the military government. And so that this violence, this violence that became generalized when Father Romero was assassinated, people came to the cathedral to pay their respects. And at the funeral, right, there were snipers that began to shoot indiscriminately at hundreds of people who were in the plaza outside of the cathedral. Right, so that the level of violence and repression was so intense in El Salvador that for many, as it happens in any war, you know, I, I, part of my family is Salvadorian, so my, I grew up in Nicaragua, my mom is Nicaraguan, but my dad is Salvadorian, who came to live in Nicaragua. Um, but my Salvadorian family, uh, many of whom actually stayed, because later, I, you know, when I went back to visit them after the war was over, and I have a cousin who was my age, he survived the war. And I learned how he survived the war. Because when you are in a situation of war, your options of survival 
right, are what? What are your options to survive a war? Huh? You can run, right? Run away, right? Some of us left. Others joined, right? Participated in the war. So for my cousin, my aunt and my family who were supporters of the government, my aunt said, you're joining the military. So my cousin survived because he joined the military, right? Just as others who joined what would then be the guerrillas, right? Who were trying to overthrow the Salvadorian military government, right? This war was between these two forces, right? This military government, and then in El Salvador you had this uh, military uh, guerrilla group called the FMLN. <laughs> Right, in El Salvador, so this was the equivalent to the Sandinistas, right, as they were seeking to um, overthrow the uh, military government, right, ideologically they were the same, again, they were part of this Cold War divide. But if people, as I said, didn't want to stay because they just didn't want to sort of be part of the conflict, they would flee. So starting around 1980, 1981 as well, we would begin to see an exodus of Salvadorians, many of whom young people, young men and women, teenagers, right? minors who were fleeing this war. And around 1981, we would begin to see the arrival of these Central Americans to the U.S.-Mexico border. The migration in the 1980s it was not the same type of migration that migrants experience today as they go across Mexico, for example. Uh, it was not as violent or as dangerous as it is today. And so that you began to see Salvadorians around beginning in 1981 seeking to enter the United States through the U.S.-Mexico border. And when these Salvadorians were caught at the border by the Border Patrol, right, the, these Salvadorians would tell the Border Patrol agents, please don't send us back. Right? We're running away from the war we are coming to the United States seeking refuge. If you remember, I mentioned how once, you know, you approach, right? So if you are seeking refuge in a country, you actually want to approach and run into a government agent, right? Because you are going to tell them, I am here seeking refuge. I am here because of the war in my country, so I want to be treated as a refugee. And so, that, when that happens, then the government agent can no longer treat you as just an undocumented immigrant. Then, this legal process that I mentioned when I, met, when I talked about right, the human exodus of the third wave, if you remember, that once you say, I am here as a refugee, then the government has to give you the right, right? You have the right to prove your case before a judge. You cannot just be deported back to your country of origin, right? Because that would be a violation of refugee rights, right? Conventions and human rights conventions. And so that as more and more Salvadorians began to arrive, they began to face right, this issue. So when they would come, they would, they would ask to be treated as refugees, but as more and more Salvadorians began to arrive, the United States government, the Reagan administration, began to take also an approach towards denying these Central Americans the rise of refugees. Because the Reagan administration 
then fell for a different reason than Nicaraguans. Right? That it was not in their interest to recognize these Central Americans as refugees. Salvadorians and then Guatemalans too would start to arrive beginning in 1981. A similar war explodes in Guatemala. And the same thing, you see this exodus. Now, in Guatemala, most of the exodus of Guatemalans in the 1980s were people coming from the countryside. So that the war in Guatemala was most intense in rural areas. Primarily where indigenous Maya-speaking people live. So most of the exodus of Guatemalans to the United States was an exodus of peasant, Maya, indigenous people. And so that you also have Guatemalans, Salvadorians now coming to the U.S.-Mexico border seeking refuge, and in both cases, the United States government decided that it was not in their interest to accept these Central Americans as refugees. And the reason for it was that, again, the Reagan administration saw this conflict through the lens of the Cold War. And for Ronald Reagan, the Cold War was the most important war to win. And that meant that in Central America, these revolutionary groups, the FMLN in El Salvador and in Guatemala, it was called the URNG. These are acronyms, and in the reading, right, you can sort of see how it is spelled out. But that these revolutionary groups, along with the Sandinistas, were seen as part of this expansion of communism in the Cold War era, there was this theory that it was used by the United States government around sort of how the threat of communism spread in the world. And it was called the, I heard it already, right? The domino effect theory, right, or the domino theory. This was an important theory that was used during the Cold War by the United States as a way of explaining how communism emerges and becomes a global threat. So the domino effect theory was like this. So when Reagan sort of takes office and the Sandinistas are now in power in Nicaragua, he views that as the very first domino to fall. Says now the communists have taken control of a country in the Latin American region. Very different from Cuba, right? Cuba is an island. So Cuba does not have borders. So in the case of Nicaragua, the threat was, and let me do here a map. Let's say this is Nicaragua, okay? Here's El Salvador, here's Honduras. Here's Guatemala, here's Mexico, and here's the U.S.-Mexico border, all right? So, the Sandinistas have now taken control of Nicaragua. And the argument was that what's next is El Salvador, right? So the communists are now fighting in El Salvador and in Guatemala. So we must do whatever it takes 
to contain the fall of the next domino, right? So the domino effect, right? If you put a, you know, lined up dominoes, right, on a row, you push one, and then the rest, right, will follow, right? One will hit the next one, and then the next one down the line, until all of the dominoes fall. That is kind of like the imagery of this theory. So they say, okay, Nicaragua is now falling to the communists. That's the first domino to fall. And if we don't contain this, right, and contain it as well in El Salvador and Guatemala, then you're going to see dominoes falling in El Salvador, and by the same token, then that could spread to Honduras, and then it's going to fall in Honduras and Guatemala, and before you know it, right, the communists are going after Mexico. And so soon enough, you're going to have communist armies marching across the U.S.-Mexico border. That was the way in which, in the 1980s, people within the Reagan administration saw this threat, this communist threat now looming, right, in Latin America, in Central America, as the potential of sort of communist armies marching into the United States from Central America. So the Reagan administration then vowed to stop the advancement of communism in Central America by funding, right, by providing military funding to both the Guatemalan and the Salvadorian armies, right, to levels where millions and millions of dollars were used to maintain these governments in power. Because the objective was to stop the advancement of communism, right? Under no circumstance were they going to allow victory of the communists in El Salvador or in Guatemala, right? So this was the attitude, this was the position coming from the Reagan administration. So, as the United States is indirectly, right, participating by funding the militaries in this war, which is causing this exodus of people, right, because this is what war causes, right, one of the causes of war is exodus, right, people fleeing a conflict zone. And so, this is what is prompting now, also the migration of peoples from the region to the United States a direct impact on the continuation of a war which was funded from one side by the United States, right? From the other side, one can make the argument it was funded by the Soviet Union and Cuba and so on, but mostly Cuba. So that this was the war. And so that for the United States, their involvement in Central America militarily was something that they really did not want to accept nor acknowledge. Because if they did, right, if they said, right, that yes, we recognize these Central Americans coming from El Salvador and Guatemala as refugees, then they would be accepting their own responsibility in producing the refugee crisis. Because they are one of the players who you know, are promoting the war in the region. And so, you know, the question is always asked, well, if you don't want these people coming into the United States, then what would be the answer? What would be the answer if you don't want to be Central Americans coming into the U.S. seeking refuge? Because they're running away from the war. What would the United States need to do if you don't want these people here? What do you think? Some type of support. Huh? Stop funding the war. Don't get involved. Stop funding the war. Right? I mean, that would be kind of like a logical solution, right? The logical solution is, okay, stop funding the damn war if you don't want people coming 
to the United States seeking refuge. But of course, for the Reagan administration, that was not an option because for the Reagan administration, what was important was to contain the advancement of communism in Central America. So, as Salvadorians and Guatemalans arrived to the United States, they too would not be recognized as refugees. They too would live in the United States primarily as undocumented refugees. Right? So they too would have the similar experience of Nicaraguans who began to arrive after 1981 for different reasons now. Right? Remember, from Nicaraguans, Reagan wanted Nicaraguans to stay in Nicaragua so that they could overthrow the Sandinistas. For Salvadorians and Guatemalans, on the other hand, Reagan wanted, did not want to acknowledge their direct involvement in those wars, right? Because if they did, then they would be also accepting the responsibility in producing this refugee crisis that is now coming to the United States, right? All of these refugees. So as a result, right, you have Central Americans who begin to arrive after 1981 who primarily have the experience of being undocumented refugees. So that, for example, Central Americans like Nicaraguans, you know, who applied, like, for example, my family, right, when we came, we applied for refugee status. We applied for political refugee status. And only around 10% of Nicaraguans who applied received a refugee status. In the case of Salvadorians and Guatemalans, it was around 2%. Right, so it's even less who received a refugee status, compared to Cubans, who Cubans got 100%, right? So you have Cubans 100%, and you have now Nicaraguans, who fared a little bit better than Salvadorians and Guatemalans, in this sense. Right? But, as I said, the overwhelming, overwhelmingly number, right, of Central Americans would be in the United States with this status, right? People who were coming to the United States legitimately as refugees, but were denied the status of being refugees. And so that for Central Americans who came to the United States seeking refuge, they would find this major obstacle, first of all. all right? This was one of the biggest challenges, right? Of being undocumented in the United States. It's a major challenge. But, they would begin to try and find a way to try to find a solution, right? So that these Central Americans began to organize in the United States now to begin a struggle for the recognition of refugees in this country. Yes? How much percentage was for Well, for Salvadorians and Guatemala, I mean, you know, two to one percent. I mean, Guatemalans were the worst because well, they were the most disenfranchised, right? As I mentioned, right, Guatemalans were mostly indigenous, Maya speaking, right? So they did not even speak Spanish. So they had a major hurdle, you know, in a country where, you know, well, a lot of people speak Spanish, but not a lot of people speak indigenous languages. Right? This is a problem that continues that indigenous people migrate to the United States face, right, in terms of translation. Right, in this country. There are very few translators of indigenous languages. And, uh, you know, like for example, 
A few months back, I was listening to the radio and there was this report of this woman who works as a domestic worker, right? But she also is the only translator in her indigenous language. Okay, so whenever there's someone who is sort of migrating to the United States and comes right to the US-Mexico border, she gets a call. Right, from lawyers, right, to serve as the translator if this person who is coming speaks her language, her particular indigenous language, because Maya, the Maya speaking population speaks several different sort of dialects of the same Maya language, right? So they're very particular. Even within Guatemala, you have different indigenous populations that speak sort of different dialects of the same Maya language. So, anyways. Right? This is for, for indigenous peoples, for Maya-speaking peoples, right? The challenges are even greater. And because also of the long legacies of marginalization that indigenous peoples face. So this is kind of like the way, you know, the problems, the challenges that they face when they arrive up to the United States. So if you look at the question, Right? If you look at the question for this final, I pretty much today address the first part and the second part of the question. So I do hope that you were noting those two things. Yes? Oh, the handout? Come and get it. Come and get it. Okay. So um, on Thursday, we will continue, right, with this discussion. So you all have a good year. You all have a good day. All right. So see you all on Thursday. Oh, sorry, I thought she gave me one. All right. And remember, don't forget to take the quiz.